you're here. I'm, I'm glad, and I'm glad you're here today with no snow, so you can uh, go home safely. <laughs> yes. Okay, we're good. Okay. Okay, and I'm ready to go anytime. Okay, very good. Well, thanks for doing this. This is a uh, this is wonderful to get to spend some time with you, and I've been looking forward to it. Pleased that you're here. Um, let's let's kind of start at the beginning. You're, okay. You're a native of a small town in New York. Yes. How I, how did how did that uh, working in the family grocery store, how did that sort of set you on your course? Well, I, I uh, as, as, you, as you mentioned, Jack, I, I, d I did grow up in a small community. Uh, uh, the town is Hudson, New York. It's about 120 miles uh, uh, north of New York City, uh, near the Massachusetts border, um, and a very old city. Uh, I think the first city incorporated after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but of course everything in the Northeast is <laughs> Pretty old, in in American history sense, uh, and it, it's a small community, and and uh, in a hamlet, outside of that, there that town, my my dad and mom had a general store, and um, my dad also had a a bakery route where he delivered um, bakery products and bread to farmers uh, in the uh, 30s and 40s and. Early 50s, uh, that still was a, a practice. Uh, a lot of farmers didn't uh, uh, create their own sweets; they bought them, and and it was true with baker products. And we had this small uh, country store where my mom was in attendance when my dad wasn't there, and uh, so uh, it was a, it was a great experience. I went to work early, uh, but I. Uh, um, Got to meet people. I was behind the counter uh, when I was still in my single digits as a, as a kid, and uh, it, it's uh, growing up in a small town uh, is, a, is is a unique experience, I think, for somebody who uh, is going to later in life interact with the public because uh, the uh, you keep meeting the same folks over and over, and uh, you get to be a student of people. I think in a way sometimes that uh, you might not get if you had grown up in a big city where um, uh, even if there's a neighborhood that you're uh, located in, folks seem to go by at maybe a faster pace and have less involvement than you do in a small town. So I think it formed uh, a lot of my views about uh, people and reacting people with people, and uh, hopefully it helped me later in life. Um, I read that uh, you were in the debate team in high school. And yes. You'd actually, you actually, you were one of those folks who early in life thought about a career in the law. I did. I was... Uh, um, I was influenced in part, uh, uh, as I think back, by uh, uh, two people, a, a high school uh, a teacher who was uh, uh, a great inspiration to me, and that's not uncommon, I think, for, for many folks. And I recall reading in uh, what was then the Weekly Reader. It was a uh, 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 paper that came to grade schools, and it spoke about the uh, high percentage of lawyers who were in the uh, national and state legislatures. And at that time, it might have been 50% or more. And I said, my gosh, uh, what a way to impact public policy. <laughs> and encouraged by, uh, by my um, uh, high school professor, I started thinking about the law early. I had no uh, contact through family, but my dad uh, did have a friend who was a lawyer and, and uh, much admired by the family. And that may have also been a inspiration to me. Did you know she tested in 16 but you need to do in 16 4 by 3? What did you have to do? I have a 4 by 3. That's fine. Okay. We're okay. It'll be a center cut. It'll be a center cut touch. Okay. And by the time it's all done, so we're okay. fine. Okay. We're fine. Um, you were, you're first generation college. I am. My, my parents are, were born in this country. Uh, my grandparents were not. Uh, but I was the first of my, of, of my, uh, my family to go to college. And, uh, uh, that was a goal of my parents, uh, so I didn't need to reflect upon it whether I would go. <laughs> that was a, a mandate. And uh, um, so I, uh, the family just, it was important to them. I, I had a sister who, unfortunately, not with me, a younger sister died a few years ago. Uh, and my folks just drilled uh, that uh, that's what's going to happen. And, uh, and much of our view of what we could spend in life uh, uh, on material matters uh, was uh, impacted by the amount of money that had to be saved every summer and through the year for college. And um, so I, uh, so yeah, and I was, it was a goal. It was important to my parents. My parents, 
uh, as I said, uh, did not graduate from high school, either of them, but both they were pleased to see both their children get three degrees each. So I, I, th I think we had enough for the whole family. So. Uh, you came to Chicago? Came and I came, I came to Chicago in, um, in, uh, in late 59 and um, uh, worked as a manufacturer's representative at the Merchandise Mart. And uh, I had um, gone to a college in upstate New York originally, uh, Union College, and graduated in 58. I uh, spent a year at Albany Law School, uh, uh, but wanted to move west, and, and I did, and um, uh, worked for about a year and a half, and then re-entered uh, uh, the law. Uh, uh, my legal education was, was uh, restarted at, at Northwestern, and uh, I stayed there and was fortunate enough to um, gain a fellowship to get a graduate degree. And so that's... Uh, that's Came out here, and um, I remember thinking that uh, my first airplane ride was, uh, uh, I think, December of 50, 57, came out to uh, Chicago, and um, I was a, uh, I thought it was in the West Coast. It was such a far, <laughs> far piece from uh, upstate New York. What, what drew you into criminal law? Well, I uh, was impacted in part uh, by, um, again, a, um, uh, in this case, a law professor. Um, uh, named Fred Imbau, who was legendary uh, at, at Northwestern, and uh, his legacy lives on in the form of um, um, uh, short courses for prosecuting and defense attorneys. And um, he uh, just urged that I consider that that wasn't a, an area where most law graduates uh, were, were interested in. And uh, I was interested in the area generally, uh, whether it was on the defense side or or the um, or the prosecution side, as it turned out, opportunities for me uh, opened up on the prosecution side, and I spent um, after a short stint in private practice uh, a, about a decade, evenly divided between being a county prosecutor in Cook County, uh, and then uh, being in the attorney general's office for the state, uh, uh, being fortunate enough to be the first assistant there, and then the last third of that decade as the first assistant uh, uh, U.S. attorney in, in the Northern District of Illinois in Chicago. Your, reputa your reputation for integrity, as I've read, uh, comes from your, in begins in many respects with your involvement uh, with a very notorious murder case in the Chicago area, the Richard Speck case. Could you tell me about that? Well, I, I, the, the, uh, the main prosecutor in that case was, was a, man, a very respected attorney named, still, still practicing, named Bill Martin, and um, the uh, and George, uh, the late George Murtaugh. Um, the two of them, mainly under Bill's leadership, assembled a, a team of uh, uh, five or six attorneys, and uh, I was a very young prosecutor on that team, and um, along with a, a man named Jim Zagel, who's a district judge here, and former uh, state cabinet officer in Illinois. And we were assigned uh, uh, much of the research, not the actual trial of the case. Um, and during the course of uh, the investigation, uh, um, issues came up that uh, were, uh, uh, it required that you make sure that there was absolutely nothing wrong <laughs> with the, the assembling of the evidence. and. Um, uh, a situation arose where I was concerned about the uh, appropriateness of the process and brought that to the attention of, um, of uh, Bill Martin, and um, he feels that that was uh, critical in the assembling of the evidence, and uh, I, I, I don't know. Well, I'd like to think maybe the roots of whatever integrity I possess were earlier, but some people feel that that was a critical point, at least that could be pointed to. Well, if, if somebody sees blood spattered shirt and they think that it's going to, you know, cinch the, right. or a street cop is going to cinch the case for them. Well, it, that could be, and it, it did involve uh, the forensics, and uh, I, I had some concerns about the, uh, uh, the uh, how that was collected, and as a result of uh, what I what I found, we eliminated that, and it did not become a problem in the case. Um, your association with Jim Thompson, sure. who was teaching at Northwestern about that time. Yes, I, uh, I met Jim Thompson, and um, I was doing graduate work at, uh, at Northwestern in the, 
um, in this program, actually uh, directed by this Professor Imbau. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Jim was, uh, I, uh, he hadn't yet, I think, become an assistant professor yet at, at the uh, law school. He was uh, uh, still an assistant state's attorney, but he was heading up a, um, a project, and, and Professor Imbau introduced us to one another. And uh, <coughs> um, some uh, shortly thereafter, a few years thereafter, he went and became an assistant professor at the law school, and and uh, and I was a um, um, a prosecutor like he had been in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Um, and Professor Imbau uh, obtained a Ford Foundation grant, uh, and uh, the the uh, grant was to uh, train lawyers to aid police departments, in-house mm -hmm. lawyers. And uh, uh, Jim and Professor Bell asked me to come over, and I took a leave of absence from the uh, uh, Cook County State's Attorney's Office and uh, spent a year and a half and was a lecturer at the law school along with running this, this program. And that's how, that's how we met. And um, I returned to the uh, prosecutor's office in Cook County, and Jim remained a professor at, uh, at the law school. And our past was to cross later because he uh, became, um, he was approached by the then Attorney General Bill Scott, the new Attorney General, as it was in, I think, 68 and um, early 69, and, and said he was starting a new criminal justice division. And the Attorney General and Jim asked me to come over, and, and so I, we went to work there. Um, and I uh, stayed with him in, um, uh, in, in that office, and then he left after about a year to become the first assistant U.S. attorney in uh, Northern District of Illinois. Um, uh, he was the first assistant to uh, Bill Bauer, who's a, a colleague of mine now on, on the uh, Court of Appeals. Um, uh, after Bauer, Judge Bauer became, uh, became a judge uh, off of uh, being the U.S. attorney. Uh, Jim Thompson was recommended by Senator Percy for appointment to be U.S. attorney. And uh, after a while, I left the post of first assistant attorney general and, and became his first assistant in in, um, in Chicago. Now, when, but at what point during your tenure did you argue the cases before the U.S. Supreme Court? That's when I was with the state attorney general oh, and uh, in uh, in '69 and '70. Uh, the attorney general is privileged to represent the state in the, in the Supreme Court. These cases arose out of. Uh, County prosecuting offices. In this case, it was Cook County. But uh, yes, I was fortunate enough to uh, argue three cases for the U.S. Supreme Court during that tenure as, uh, at the Attorney General's office. And uh, uh, that's a, for any lawyer, that's a great that's a great experience. One of those cases, I believe, Allen versus Illinois, was very. Uh, very a lot of your colleagues, your future colleagues yeah. in the judicial profession, were very uh, sure glad to see this. Could you tell me? Tell us a little bit about well, sure. It, it is. It is. You know. It's perhaps uh, one for someone who's argued the case, he shouldn't call it landmark, but some people consider it a landmark case. Um, the case arose out of a, uh, uh, a bank robbery in, in Illinois and uh, in Cook County, a state court prosecution. And uh, I believe it was, it may have been a robbery now, I'm trying to think, a bank robbery. It was just, a, no, it was a robbery. Uh, and um, the, um, the case involved uh, an unruly defendant, and the defendant, uh, I was not involved in the prosecution of the case. Uh, this came to us afterward, at the conviction. And he had been excluded from um, uh, the courtroom, and the, um, um, he subsequently sought relief in the federal courts, saying that he had, by being removed, he had been denied the right of confrontation. And so the, um, um, the case came actually to this court, and in a uh, two-to-one ruling, uh, this court uh, um, said that he had been denied the right of constitution, the court I now sit on. I was impressed with the dissent as a assistant attorney general and decided to um, uh, take the case to the Supreme Court, or at least ask the Supreme Court to take the case. You have to have leave, obviously. And they did. It was an interesting time because, if you recall, Jack, that was right after the Conspiracy 7 trial, and, and it was a very uh, tense time in America between all the conflicts that were going on in the late 60s and early 70s. 
and they took the case in, in a unanimous ruling, which uh, I believe one commentator said was the first unanimous ruling since World War II for the prosecution. Uh, they empowered uh, a trial judge in state or federal court uh, to remove a, um, an unruly defendant with appropriate warnings and, and an opportunity to come back. If, but uh, before that, uh, what was the practice, and it occurred in, in the Conspiracy 7 case, where they actually bound and gagged somebody, and I had been upset at the sight of someone being tied in a chair. I said, that can't be the answer. And so we took the case up, and, and, uh, and right after that, though there were some very tumultuous trials, uh, there were no courtroom disruptions by defendants. So uh, it's been a great tool that uh, uh, trial judges have not had to employ just by, because of just possessing the, the right seemed to have had an impact. So I'm very pleased with the outcome of that. You, uh, you as you said, you, you crossed paths with Jim Thompson again, I believe. Yes. And, well, uh, and this was uh, this was in the Kerner case. Well, I, I I was not involved in the Kerner case. What what happened but you is came into his, uh, well, his office well, I I was as I mentioned the first assistant attorney general, right. and uh, intending to just remain there as long as the attorney general saw fit to have me in that post. It's a great post. I. Went to Springfield regularly, and you know it's a, it was a great great opportunity for a young lawyer. Um, and Jim had asked me to come over as a, as his first assistant, but uh, the attorney general was reluctant to have me make that switch. And uh, in fact, I said, "Why don't the two of you work it out?" I I had wanted to be a federal prosecutor much earlier, and that opportunity didn't come about. So. Um, I basically said, no, I, I, the Attorney General wants me to remain, and I feel I should do that. And then, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Governor, former Governor uh, Kerner, actually a judge of this court, uh, was indicted. It was prior to my uh, uh, coming to the office. Uh, and uh, uh, received a call from Jim, and he informed me that, uh, well, I mean, I read the of the indictment, that there would come a time where uh, both he and the person who was the acting first assistant, uh, uh, Sam Skinner, who went on to a very illustrious career of his own, uh, would have to, in effect, commit themselves totally to this case. And uh, it would be pretty important that, or he felt that I come over and, and, and be the uh, first assistant, kind of act the, acting U.S. Attorney, run the on the operation. The Attorney General was very gracious and agreed in that. So I came over. Uh, the case was tried while I was here, but I, uh, it was prosecuted by uh, Jim and, and Sam Skinner and some other assistants. Uh, Coming over at that time, though, to this office, uh, to that office, how did that set the stage for your uh, eventual appointment to a federal Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't have that in mind. I, <laughs> uh, I, I just was glad to have an opportunity to serve uh, in, a, in another prosecutorial role. I, I had really felt good about the uh, opportunities at the county and state level. <coughs> and since I had, had at one time sought to be a, an assistant U.S. attorney, but the opportunity just didn't come about uh, right after law school, um, I, in a way I welcomed just to see that. And I thought that I'd spend a few years of that. And then uh, after this base of trial and appellate work, I'd, I'd um, go into the private sector again. Um, well, um, a vacancy occurred in, uh, on the district court, and uh, Senator Percy, uh, um, who was uh, really, I felt, uh, in many ways, uh, put politics aside and, and the issue of, uh, uh, of judicial selection. And I think, whether one was a supporter or not of him, I think he's been recognized through the years as, as having set that standard. Um, uh, asked what I consider submitting my name. I did. Uh, I was pretty young, 37. Uh, I think the average entry age was 59, Jack, at that time. <laughs> so uh, there was some question. He, he said, um, um, now I'm, after interviewing me, he said, I'm going to put your name forward, but you have to get this uh, rating from the ABA, and if it's not at the highest, then and the ABA at that time uh, had a standard, I think, of 12 years. You had a practice. I only had 11. So they were good enough to waive it 
but with no guarantee of how would, the rating would come out. Um, uh, but it, fortunately, it, it, it came out well, and uh, so he um, he advanced my name, and uh, uh, President Ford was uh, uh, good enough to accept the recommendation, and um, and uh, was nominated in uh, December, November of, of '74, and in December uh, uh, was appointed. Uh, the following month, I took the oath of office. You were the youngest judge. Youngest in the country, not the youngest ever. Uh, President Roosevelt had appointed a, a very young judge uh, whose name you'll be familiar with, Al Murrah. That's the of uh, the famous Murrah Building, which was tragically destroyed in the in the, the bombing. And uh, uh, so, not the youngest, or just the youngest at the time. But I, I felt uh, it was a real challenge, uh, you know. And understandably, the bar, I'm sure, uh, though they had been very supportive of those that were interviewed. Um, uh, and I, I, so I went on the bench in January '75. Said goodbye to my friends in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the sense that couldn't work with them anymore. And for eight, not quite eight and a half years, served on that trial bench in Chicago. And um, and in uh, the spring of '83, was uh, fortunate enough to be appointed by uh, President Reagan. Coming to the coming to the federal judgeship at that early age, what sort of pressure or or focus did that put upon you uh, sure. as you focused your energies to being the best you could be? Well, uh, there's no question that th because of the appointment got uh, such notoriety on, on, on age, not just locally but even beyond that, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to ruin it for other people who were young and being considered for the job. Uh, in many ways, uh, I've often thought perhaps the sweet spot for appointment ought to be 45 to 55 where You've gotten significant experience and, and uh, hopefully uh, developed enough maturity. But I, um, I was aware uh, that uh, I had had such a heavily criminally oriented practice, although with the Attorney General being the first assistant, obviously I supervised a lot of civil litigation. But I had personally been mainly involved in criminal work, both appellate and trial. Uh, so I knew that. Uh, and understandably, the civil bar would know, w would wonder whether I was sensitive to uh, issues of cost, uh, the, the amount of time for discovery, uh, matters that uh, attend uh, civil litigation that uh, are not the same with as criminal. And so I, I really worked hard at that, and uh, um, I guess I just did the best I could, and, and uh, it seemed the bar seemed to be supportive when years later. I was considered for elevation, so uh, I hope it worked out. For, for the lay person who, who might be watching this, sure. what is the difference between being a trial court judge and sure. then sitting on a court of review? The responsibilities sure. are vastly different. Right. Well, the the uh, the pace and tempo of the trial court is 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 pretty intense. Um, um, you sit alone. I mean, you're aided by counsel on on both sides, but there's a uh, you are the face uh, to the public, the initial judicial face to the public, and, um, and in many ways, uh, literal, the literal face, because uh, appellate judges uh, have more of a faceless image, I think, to, to the public than the trial judge, and then the smaller the community you're in, the, the even the higher profile of, of the trial judge. So um, you, if, if you're a, uh, a committed trial judge, as I think most are, you realize that the job can best be handled by having a great uh, reliance on the bar. And when, if you're a young judge, then for sure you've got to have great reliance on the bar. And I, and I, I think that, uh, um, that so lawyers have a great impact on, on, on the uh, trial of the case. When it gets to the appellate level, uh, the case is tried, the, the record has been created, uh, the role of an appellate lawyer, which is is uh, is, is different, but but is also important, is to um, uh, either underscore th that there is no perfect trial. Let me say that, Jack. That there's minimal error or there's substantial error. So it's uh, um, I, I guess a, a, a the I would say to the average citizen the appellate responsibility is to be a filter that makes you comfortable that the vast bulk of justice that's dispensed at the trial level uh, has been done well. And uh, in this country, since, uh, the, again, the majority of cases are affirmed on appeal, it, it should give, it's there to give you assurance 
that uh, the process uh, it does get at least a, a scrubbing uh, by a panel of at least three or more judges. And um, so it's a little more reflective setting. I, I would say uh, if, if you enjoy the scholarship of the law, uh, you have more time to reflect on the, as an appellate judge than a trial judge. The trial judge is under great pressure to instantly uh, make a uh, decision. Appellate judges have uh, uh, much more time. Uh, trial judges are fond of reminding appellate judges that they have this uh, luxury. And there's a saying that uh, appellate judges come down after the battle and shoot the wounded. And um, maybe you've heard that expression by trial, <laughs> by trial judges of appellate judges. But, but I, I, I've enjoyed both the opportunities. They're, they're different roles. And um, in the main, we give great deference to the trial judge because of the enormous pressure. And therefore, the systems, both state and federal, invest great discretion in a trial judge. Uh, much of what a trial judge does is not or cannot be reviewed in the sense that we, because it, we give so much discretion. It's, it's uh, appellate judge's responsibility other than the evolution of the law, that is to look sometimes beyond the individual case, is, is as I say, uh, to give, I think, the public uh, confidence that uh, things did not go awry uh, for whatever reason at the trial level. As, as a judge rises in responsibilities, in your case, to uh, chief judge of the Seventh uh, Circuit, uh, uh, there's a lot of administrative chores that come along with this. Right. And if you would, you're talking about parts of three different states. Here. Right. Well, the, 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 all of three, all, all three states, states. Uh, Indiana, Wisconsin, yeah. Illinois. So you're, you're administering a, a, a court system that encompasses uh, over 20 million people. Uh, and um, uh, it, it is a challenge. However, on the federal side, I'm not as familiar, obviously, with the state side in this regard. On the federal side, we're blessed with very good administrative uh, help. Uh, we've got people who uh, have long tenure in the federal system. We're, of course, smaller than, than, than the state court system. The, the bulk of justice in this country is administered by the 40,000 plus uh, state court judges. It's, it's uh, much fewer than 1,000 uh, active judges administering the, uh, the federal side. But uh, it, it, it is a challenge. Um, but within our three states, uh, there are seven federal districts, and each of them has a chief judge of the district. And, and so much of the administration of the individual districts are handled by the, by the, um, by the individual chief judges. And um, so it varies. Administrative responsibilities in federal circuits can range from maybe 20 percent of your time to uh, the largest circuit in, in, in the country, the Ninth Circuit, out based, uh, headquartered in California, where uh, maybe the chief judge needs 50 percent of his or her time to, to administer it. But it's, it's, uh, you're helped by your colleagues, uh, but your colleagues are, have the same size commission you have, and they have uh, life tenure. So <laughs> you, uh, uh, if you uh, want to be a chief judge and a successful one, you, um, you need to work with consensus. So I, I and when you reach that level, you become the, a member of the Judicial Conference? You do. Mm -hmm. The Judicial Conference of the United States is made up, Jack, of um, the chief judges of the regional circuits and a, um, a district judge representative from each of the circuits. Uh, together with the Chief Justice of the United States. And <coughs> they set policy for the court, uh, speaking on issues of cameras in the courts and, and the like. Um, uh, and, and while you uh, are there under the direction of the Chief Justice, he, he can assign you specific tasks. He has an executive committee. I was privileged to be on that under, um, under Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, so it's a great honor, great responsibility. It, it sets national policy, meets twice a year uh, in Washington. Uh, they, they come together. Um, you're usually addressed by leading members of Congress uh, who uh, either uh, share praise or uh, constructive criticism for the judiciary. <laughs> um, it's not really a dialogue. You just hear their, their, their comments, although you do get occasion to, to interact with them. Uh, so that that that's an additional responsibility if you're the chief of a circuit. What were the, what were the uh, when you were on this uh, this conference? There were some specific issues that you were well, yes. With. Well, it, it uh, what had occurred during my tenure on on the executive committee of the conference were uh, severe budget 
constraints that were uh, imposed on the judiciary as well as the rest of the government. And the uh, uh, Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who was uh, very committed to uh, an appropriate uh, reduction in our costs. So I, uh, though I'd never planned in my life to be a budgeteer, I, I learned to do it. And uh, so over a, a period of uh, a couple of years under the leadership of a, a, a distinguished judge, uh, Carolyn King, who was the chairperson of the executive committee, we went about uh, uh, suggesting cost-cutting measures uh, as I, you and I spoke separately about uh, the simple issue of subscriptions. We were spending millions of dollars on subscriptions uh, to periodicals, for example, uh, there were and books mainly that law clerks today and judges don't don't use because of the uh, of the computer. So we we went about uh, a cost saving. It was uh, we looked at um, costs in construction of, of uh, courthouses, and uh, we had to delay some construction across the country, and and caused a renewed focus on how, how big a courthouse it should be and and the like. So. Uh, we, we, the Chief Justice was pleased uh, with the results, and we, we affected some, some substantial savings. Security concerns were also yes. Paramount. Well, it, it, tragically, uh, in in recent years, the federal judiciary has been visited by uh, uh, the deaths of family members and indeed judges as a result of uh, criminal conduct, and the um, uh, security. Uh, Issues ar arose, uh, highlighted in, in fact in this circuit by uh, uh, the tragedies that attended Judge Lefko's family. We um, uh, asked Congress, and, and they were very, very supportive in, in, in increased funds for security. And uh, without going into too many details about that, because that is, uh, I suppose, helpful to the system, we've we've uh, had uh, added martial strength and added uh, home security. Um, but it uh, it did be, it is a, an ugly problem that uh, tragically confronts uh, confronts us sometimes. When did you step back from being uh, chief judge? When? Yes. In November of uh, uh, just two years ago, November of uh, of uh, actually on my birthday. You cannot you can uh, you must take a chief judgeship before your 65th birthday, and you cannot hold it past your 70th. So on my 70th birthday, I uh, turned the Chief Judgeship over to Chief Judge Easterbrook. So, what's your work like? What's your work life uh, like nowadays? You know, well, I don't. I'm freed up with some of these administrative responsibilities, but I have remained an active judge. I, I carry a full load, and uh, I've chosen not to, at this point, take senior status. Uh, I, um, I, I'm pretty much in love with the law. I, I think that my friends say it's pretty obvious, uh, and uh, um, the opportunity to serve uh, this long is is, is has been a great reward to me. So I uh, just come to work every day and i um, privileged to hold a job. I know it's a, it's a life tenure job, but I view it as just a, a leasehold, Jack, and it, I want to pass it on to the next person in as good a fashion as the, the seat, as, as they call it, uh, uh, as, as the way I received it. And then, then I respect the man who held it before me and whether the man or woman, who, whoever that is that takes it after me, I just uh, they have their own seat, so to speak. But but I want to, I just want to leave behind a body of work that uh, people feel was the result of a, a committed and an independent magistrate. Is, uh, I think you touched upon this a little earlier. Uh, a lot of the law students that you went to school with, for example, went into private practice. Yes, and that was obviously an option for you. Sure, you, you did do some of that. Uh, much more lucrative in the long run. Well, yeah. public service? Well, I, I, um, I, I think I was drawn to it early. I, um, well, in fact, I'm sure I was. As I mentioned to you, it was, I was inspired to think about public service by uh, high school teachers and then law professors. Um, I, I, I'm very indebted to this country. I really feel that way. I, I feel that uh, if uh, my four bearers had not, uh, forefathers had not uh, seen fit to come here, uh, and I w was to be raised in Europe, uh, I don't know at what age I could have I could have made it to. I was born in 1936, so um, I'm not sure that uh, life would have been very fruitful for me in, in if I, my family had not come to America. And I have felt that debt 
ever since I became aware of the unique circumstances of my grandparents coming here. And, um, but I don't view public service just as a chance to repay, which I, I feel in part. I, um, I, I think it's a high calling in no matter what role you have in public service. And um, um, it's just been a great reward for me. I, I, lawyers who are in private practice make great contributions. The, the machinery of commerce, the bulk of uh, what lawyers do is to make things easier for, for, for people, not, not to cause strife. And so they, 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 they're an essential to the, uh, the governance of the country, uh, especially in civil matters as well as criminal, but especially in civil with the bulk of lawyers' practice. But, uh, but for me, um, I, I just uh, uh, felt this, uh, this guiding star of public service. It, it just, it, I don't know how to better explain it other than uh, it's pretty much all I wanted to do. Um, like many kids, I, I thought about uh, other careers <laughs> in, in sports, but uh, uh, I made an early assessment uh, that... Uh, my talents lie mainly as a fan and not as a professional athlete. <laughs> so I became a professional fan. So I, I, I think it's just being raised not only by a family that revered the public service, even though they were not directly involved, but this love of country. Uh, my parents were extremely patriotic. Uh, uh, I remember as a Cub Scout um, in a small town marching in the Memorial Day Parade with the flag, and uh, it, just, uh, it was just special to me. So I, I uh, kind of try to keep that spirit alive. At the end of the day, when, when, when someone in, in, in your calling uh, picks up the briefcase and starts for home, what gives you the greatest sense of personal satisfaction for what you've done? Well, uh, I tell my law clerks that the, uh, when we go about examining a case, Jack, um, and when I have to come to resolution about that case with my colleagues, I want our focus to be on the person who lost the litigation, not the person who won. The person who won uh, may be interested in how you came about the process, but they're generally just pleased that they're successful in litigation. To me, uh, it's very important that the person who lost uh, come away as best they can, both the lawyer and the litigant, with the sense that their issues were addressed. They may not agree with all the reasoning and all the outcome, but they believe uh, an impartial set of judges looked at it, uh, gave it their all, and, and did the best they can. And so I try to walk away at the end of the day, if I've come to a resolution in a particular case, saying, have I administered this post in a fashion that if an objective observer looked at it, he'd say he kept in mind at all time the losing side. Uh, as I said, the, the winner uh, may not be as analytical about the, the reasoning of your opinion. They're just pleased that the outcome is what it is. But I'm very concerned that the person who uh, didn't win in a particular piece of litigation uh, feel that the, the process was fair. And that gives me great satisfaction. Together with the opportunity to work with young lawyers, uh, I've had um, in it's almost 34 years uh, about 90 clerks. And um, they become uh, friends and, and um, lifelong friends. Uh, and the privilege of being able to impact their careers early and, and hopefully their view of the law and life generally is, is a, just an added reward. It's kind of how we feel about working with students before we do. Sure. Um, one of your colleagues uh, described you, your court, as incredibly collegial. How, how do you maintain an air of collegiality in such an incredibly talented, highly uh, focused, very strong-minded group of people? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I enjoy working with my colleagues. I, that, let me let me say that. And as, and and during my tenure as chief, uh, I I tried to not let. Uh, more than two weeks go by without having contact with all of them. Uh, and while half the court is uh, Chicago-centric in the sense of residents, the other half is, is, is located in other parts of Wisconsin and, and Indiana. So I, 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 I try to stay in touch. 
uh, I like all my colleagues, and uh, I uh, try to take this job very seriously, but not myself. And I'm known to be a little bit of a tease, and so I try to blend a little humor into the seriousness of what we do. Uh, and I, I, I think that uh, um, if you're a people person, it's not a hard thing to do. And I, maybe it goes back to the roots in this small town country store. I just enjoy the dialogue, uh, and uh, um, and it's been a great journey. So I, I don't mind sharing that that story with not that particular story, but many stories with of my upbringing with my colleagues. I enjoy hearing from them. And if you really want to um, blend uh, your experience with others, that goes a long way toward uh, impacting collegiality. And uh, I try to be a student not only of the, of the law, but of my colleagues. And, uh, and I think it's an enriching experience personally, and I think it makes you a better judge. One thing I didn't ask about was your interest in working uh, in on the military side of justice. Sure. Within, within yes, I was I was privileged to receive a commission as a reserve JAG officer and uh, and uh, served a decade uh, uh, of doing that. I um, had attempted to be in the uh, military service earlier, but uh, was unable to because of uh, physical limitations. I was able to overcome that, and um, and the Navy was good enough to. Uh, at a little more senior age, let me receive the commission. And <coughs> so for a decade, I, uh, I drilled as a reservist, in, uh, mainly in, in Great Lakes in Illinois, but also in Washington and other sites, and uh, had an opportunity to get involved with military justice. I had uh, always wanted to do that. Many, several members of my family had served in the military, but I, I um, felt with so many Americans having had that experience, uh, when I was a trial judge, I, I said, you know, uh, if, if, if it would be important to me to see, have an insight, a special insight. So um, uh, that's that's what happened. I developed new friendships, and uh, so for two weeks in the summer, I uh, was an uh, active reservist, and one weekend uh, a month was uh, what they call a weekend warrior, uh, although with briefs, not uh, not with weapons. <laughs> I think we're pretty much to the end of our questioning. Sure. Uh, anything that uh, I might have left out? That you well, no, I, I, I don't think so, Jack. You're, you're, you're a, good, uh, uh, a good questioner. I, I, um, I'm, I've, um, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to, to be here. I'm honored that uh, you would think I'm worthy of, a, oh. of an interview. And uh, I, I'm, it's, 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 uh, it's a privilege to hold this post, and uh, uh, I try never to forget that. And I have reminded uh, some very close friends that if they ever had a sense that I uh, didn't continue to have that awareness of the, the, uh, the both the importance of the job and the uh, and the need to retain uh, your own humility as well as your capacities, uh, you better tell me. And I, I'm pretty sure that they'll uh, those few that I've entrusted with that responsibility will, will remind me if I've uh, stayed too long. I, uh, my my uh, my dream is to. Um, to, as I think you know I'm a baseball fan. I, I, I'd like to uh, follow the lead of Ted Williams, the great Boston slugger, and hit a home run my last time at bat. So if I can come use that as a metaphor, try to leave on whenever that time comes uh, with a sense that uh, I was still at the top of my game, that would be a lot, mean a lot to me. That's an excellent point to conclude with. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Wonderful talking to Thank you. you.